Good morning, everyone, from Ford City, Pennsylvania, on Thursday, January the 6th, 2022. This, this is Chuck King bringing you the morning Bible study. We're studying the Word uh, diligently, verse by verse, to compare ourselves and our churches with the New Testament and its doctrine, because the church has drifted so far away from the original plan of the apostolic church of that first century that was sent out, empowered, and given revelation by the Holy Spirit for the church to the end of the age. And men have changed almost everything in the modern churches so that the religion that we see coming from our churches today cannot compare with the New Testament and its standards. So that's why we're in the Word of God every morning bringing you a short teaching so that you can be challenged to always go back to the original plan and purpose given by the Lord uh, through the New Testament and his early first century leaders. So let's look at Philippians chapter 2 today. Philippians chapter 2 verse number 1. Therefore, if, if there be any encouragement in Christ, if there be any consolation of love, if there is any fellowship of the Spirit, if any affection and compassion make my joy complete by being of the same mind, maintaining the same love, united in spirit, intent on one purpose. There's a whole lot here in these first two verses. Paul's appealing to the church in Philippi that he was uh, the original apostle who founded uh, the, that group of churches spread around the geographical countryside. But he, he sent a letter to all of them that they might get uh, communication about this uh, teaching and revelation from the Lord. And he's appealing to them if they've been encouraged at all by the Lord, if, if they've been comforted by his love, if they have had koinonia, this intimate fellowship with the Holy Spirit, if, if they've experienced his affection and compassion, then he says, make his joy complete. Make my joy, the Paul the Apostle, make my joy complete. How? By being of the same mind, that means being in unity on your thinking and your love, united in spirit and intent on one purpose. You see how the church should be functioning according to the head, Jesus Christ our Lord, and not according to the ideas, cultures, or traditions of men. We have fallen so far from this standard Preachers like to preach on Philippians chapter 2, but the church has failed. And we need to take this message seriously. If the Lord has done anything for us by his grace and mercy, by the power of his spirit, his fruit and his gifts, we need to seek him for this unity among us as believers that is New Testament, not traditional, not cultural, not the teaching of men. Look at verse number three. Do nothing from selfishness or empty conceit, but with humility of mind, regard one another as more important than yourselves. So he calls us away from this perspective of, of worldliness that is selfishness, self-centered, that's what carnality is. It's lustful. It's self-centered. It's a conceited thinking that we are the only important ones. Everything has to be done for me. Instead, we should embrace humility. That means lower ourselves before the Lord and, and everyone else to demonstrate that we are not the most important. We're going to love our neighbors. We love ourselves. We're going to, we're going to regard other believers 
as more important than ourselves. And that's what humility does. Humility puts ourselves in the lowest place, like Jesus said. Take the lowest place, and if you get invited then to the highest place, that's, that's great. So humility is a key here to walking in unity with other believers. Now remember, the unity with other believers doesn't have anything to do with compromising the Word of God. This revelation that came from the Holy Spirit and comes from the Holy Spirit. It doesn't mean that we just all gather around the campfire, hold hands and sing Kumbaya, regardless of doctrine, regardless of, of direction of those people. No, the call here is if God has done something for us, then follow his word. Be unified based upon his revelation, not your own ideas, not your selfish ideas. Verse 4, do not merely look out for your own personal interests, but also for the interests of others. You see, this is one of the huge problems of our local churches. Uh, they're, they're concerned about their own little business, their own little group. And uh, the success of that group is, is where they invest their time, their talent, their treasures. They, they aren't really concerned about the, the greater body of Christ, what the head of the church wants, what the New Testament teaches. But they are concerned about their personal interests, what benefits them. But we're supposed to have a broader view, the interest of the other members of the body of Christ. Verse 5, have this attitude in yourselves, which was also in Christ Jesus. Now, we're going to talk about a Jesus attitude. We're supposed to have the same attitude, the same outlook on life, the same way of practicing the Word of God to do the Father's will. Who, verse, verse 6, who, although he existed in the form of God, did not regard equality with God a thing to be grasped. We're talking about Jesus with the Father for all eternity. And when he is asked by his Father to come and give himself for the, for the sins of, of the world, he didn't consider his high position as God something to be held on to. That's what that means here. Look at verse 7. But he emptied himself. He emptied himself. You see, he... He denied himself. All, all that glory was set aside, taking the form of a bondservant and be, being made in the likeness of men. What a step down for the, the great God, our Lord Jesus Christ, to do the Father's will, to set aside his glory, his eternal glory, and come to the earth in the form of a human being and a bondservant, the scripture says. And we're to have that same attitude. Get off your high horse, your own selfish plan, your ambitions, your hopes and your dreams, your personal goals. Forget them, set them aside and realize that the will of the Father is the most important thing. Verse number eight, being found in appearance as a man, there it is again, he humbled himself by becoming obedient to the point of death, even death on a cross. We know the gospel. We know the revelation of Jesus coming. God coming to earth, becoming a man, and giving himself on the cross for the sins of the world. For this reason also, verse 9, God highly exalted him and bestowed on him the name which is above every name because he obeyed his father to empty himself and come down to earth as a man to live a perfect life without sin to die on the cross and shed his precious blood to redeem all those who believe because of this our father in heaven highly exalted him and gave him the name above every name. Verse 
10, so that at the name of Jesus, every knee will bow, Old Testament quote, every knee will bow of those who are in heaven and on earth and under the earth, and that every tongue will confess that Jesus Christ is Lord to the glory of God the Father. All creation in heaven and earth and even uh, all the dead will confess, will bow their knee that Jesus Christ is Lord and this will all glorify our Father in heaven. Every knee will bow. You will see it. You will experience it. This is the prophecy that's coming forth because of what Jesus has done for us. Verse 12, so then, my beloved, just as you have always obeyed, not as in my presence only, but, but now much more in my absence, work out your salvation with fear and trembling. So we, we have this exhortation. If we have been blessed by the Lord, experienced koinonia with him, have, having the Holy Spirit move in our lives, then we need the same mindset, the same attitude of the Lord Jesus. We need to consider others more important than ourselves. We need to humble ourselves in order to do the will of the Father, just like Jesus did, emptying himself of all of his glory, coming to earth and redeeming mankind, and now being in the highest place with the, the greatest name, and every knee will bow to him. We must embrace this truth, these truths, and obedience to his word must be our passion, our purpose, to do the will of the Father, just as you have always obeyed. Not only when the apostle was around, he tells the church in, in Philippi, but while he is away, he says, work out your salvation with fear and trembling. The reason for the fear and trembling is the great battle that we are facing every moment of every day. The spiritual battle that we talked about from Ephesians chapter 6. We are not battling people. We are battling supernatural fallen angels, demonic powers and principalities. And we need the armor of God to take our stand. And this is what the apostle was telling the Philippian church. Work out your salvation with fear and trembling. Verse 3, for it is God who is at work in you, both to will and to work for his good pleasure. The will of the Father must be our priority every day. God is working in us. The Holy Spirit has manifested his love and his fruit in our lives, his gifting in our lives. And we need, in with fear and trembling, to honor the Lord, to do his will. We need to fight this fight. It's called the good fight of faith in the scripture. Work out by the grace. It's by grace, by faith. It's by his anointing. We can't do anything right in our natural selves. So forget about this being a works message. It's not. The only work we can do is the work that he does through us by grace. It's for his good pleasure that we serve him. We need the attitude of Jesus. Look at verse 16. Do all things without grumbling or disputing. This is a big problem, isn't it? People love to grumble and dispute. We need to. We love to uh, fight and argue and complain against not only one another, but even against the standard of the Lord. We should embrace his word, his calling, his plan, his will, and do it all without grumbling or disputing. So that, verse, the next verse, 15, so that you will prove yourselves to be blameless and innocent, children of God, above reproach in the midst of a crooked and perverse generation among whom you appear as lights in the world. The reason we need to be a good example with the Jesus attitude of humility and submission 
to do the Father's will, to love people as we love ourselves. We need to do all things His way so that we, the fruit of our lives will prove us innocent and blameless and children of God who are above reproach in the midst of this dark generation, this perverse and crooked generation that Paul says we as disciples are the lights among them. We are the light in the world among this dark, wicked generation. Verse 16, holding fast the word of life, that's keeping to the word, obeying the word of God, so that in the day of Christ, that means the day that we stand before him, I will have reason to glory because I did not run in vain nor toil in vain. Now Paul speaks of a very uh, clear reality, that it's possible to do the ministry among the people that he had done and find out at the end of his life that there was no fruit, that what his work had been done in vain. His, his, his race, his toil had been done in vain, which means it had been done for nothing. It was wasted. All the hard work, the persecution, the, uh, the service he did among the churches. Because why would it be in vain? Well, if they don't hold fast to the word of God, uh, if, if they don't remain lights in a dark generation, if they, if they don't embrace the Jesus attitude of humility and servanthood and that nothing is more important than to do the will of the Father, then all of his work could be in vain. And we don't want to see that happen in any of our lives, that our whole Christian testimony would be in vain. Look what he says to close this section out, verse 17 and 18. But even if I am being poured out as a drink offering upon the sacrifice and service of your faith, I rejoice and share my joy with all of you. You too, I urge, rejoice in the same way and share your joy with me. So he's saying, I'm facing persecution to death, being poured out as an offering to the Lord because of my service to you. And he's calling on them to rejoice and be filled with joy because of the labor of love that had been done in the churches of Philippi. What a message for us to, to ponder and to consider and to examine ourselves and reflect upon. I say that we, if we read this and we're honest before the Lord, there will have to be much change of thinking and behavior that will come up to come to pass in our lives. So I'm praying for that. My whole life, my whole ministry is geared toward calling the church to repentance, to come back to the standard of Scripture, that the church might become the church without spot or wrinkle, the church that is pleasing to the Father, doing His will, as lights in a dark world. God bless you. We'll talk to you tomorrow.